Hello, everyone. I would like to um, thank the organizers first for their invitation to present um, at this exciting um, symposium. I'll be discussing today B cells and human solid tumors. Um, and primarily the question I always get asked in, in my research um, program is what they're important for and, and why we should understand them better in um, solid tumors. So the way that we go about studying B cells in human tumors in, in my research lab is by looking at a multi-level approach of the immune transcriptome of those cells by single cell RNA-seq. Um, doing microscaled functional assays to look at the function, um, gentle functions of the B cells. We do a lot of high level flow cytometry, um, both um, 15 to 18 parameters and then spectral cytometry, which is more computationally based that allows us to measure 35 markers. And we also do a lot of locational studies, especially because B cells are located within tertiary lymphoid structures, which I'll talk more about here in a few minutes. And we compare that with some new technologies, technologies via nanostring um, digital spatial profiler. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please feel free to email me since this is a recorded event. Um, I am available at this email below. So the first thing I wanna start with is just why we should care about the immune system. Um, in patients that have cancer. So I initially started my studies in lung cancer patients, and you can see here that this is a scan from a patient that was um, pre-treatment, pre-PD-1 treatment, two months post and four months post. And for those of you that aren't used to looking at these scans, you have red um, arrows that point out the nodules in these patient lungs. And after two months of PD-1 treatment, the nodules expanded, but it was biopsied and determined that these were immune cells. Um, and, and then at four months, they had gone away. And so this is really great, and it was really important to me as a graduate student, because I was actually screening these antibodies um, as a grad student before they were chosen to go into the clinical trials, and now they are standard of care. Um, and, and while this has been really effective, um, there's, there still is a lot of work to be done. Particularly, there's a lot of patients that don't respond to immunotherapies that are currently given by standard of care. Um, and in clinical trials. And there's other immune cells in there other than T cells. And a lot of the immunotherapies have been very T cell centric. Um, and, and thirdly, B cells, which is the focus of today's talk, um, are very abundant in the tumor microenvironment. In fact, they're the second most abundant um, lymphocyte in most TMEs. So um, I was given the opportunity um, in, back in January to write the news and views for three papers um, that came out that really highlighted the importance of B cells, not only in solid tumors, but in immunotherapy. And it was shown that um, having B cells and having tertiary lymphoid structures actually correlated with better prognosis um, and um, also better response to immunotherapy um, in melanoma, sarcoma, and renal cell um, carcinoma. So that was really encouraging. And it's not just in immunotherapy, as I've already alluded to, but also in um, just solid tumors in general, if we track lymphocyte infiltration, there has been shown time and time again that CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells correlate with better prognosis of these patients. And again, these are lung cancer patients. But what was really nice about this paper that is actually old now is um, that they also showed B cells. And um, they actually showed that B cells were um, correlated with better prognosis in these lung cancer patients. And that's not only in whole tissue sections, but it's also been shown in TMAs. Um, from several groups, and this is from um, Kurt Shelford's group that does a lot of imaging and, and work on um, immune cells within um, multispectral imaging techniques. And again, it's not just lung. I've showed you some examples in lung um, in the last two slides, but it's also in head and neck, colorectal, breast, ovarian, cervical, and other solid tumors that I've already mentioned, such as melanoma and renal cell. Um, so they're important and they correlate with survival and immune response, but what could they potentially be doing? Um, so this slide is meant to set the stage for potential functions of B cells. And um, here on the left-hand side, these are mouse um, studies that really contribute to the pro-tumor side of things. That's because a lot of mouse models are not um, long-term enough or immunogenic enough to have formation of tertiary lymphoid structures. And that's where a lot of B cells reside, actually, are in these structures. So a lot of these studies in, in mouse models, and there are a few in humans, have indicated that B cells actually have inhibitory receptors, secrete suppressive cytokines, um, um, generate nonspecific antibodies, and that, re that um, results in um, myeloid cell recruitment that then um, dampens the immune response. 
within the tumor microenvironment. And then in a lot of autoimmune studies, they actually educate Treg cells. However, in humans, um, it's more been the case that they have an anti-tumor function. And I demonstrated that with some of the survival data and um, the immunotherapeutic response that I showed you just a minute ago. But um, some of the potential functions that have also been shown are antigen presentation or education of T cells by B cells, tumor reactive antibody production, which is of course the first thing we think of, um, ADCC via NK um, cell mediated killing, um, tertiary lymphoid structure formation, which I've already alluded to, and also direct tumor lysis. And so really in our lab, um, what we're trying to do is understand B cell function, both in solid tumors, but also we have um, some projects where we're looking at pre-neoplasia or pre-malignancy to understand their role earlier on. And all of these studies will then help us to determine how to effectively target B cells and immunotherapies for cancer patients. So to start off and give you a picture in lung cancer, um, and I'm going to start off in lung cancer and move into he head and neck and then come back to lung cancer at the end. Um, these are two um, Vectra stains of and this is actually back when Perkin Elmer still owned Vectra um, when these were done. So this is a, a while ago. But what was very clear from this initial, these initial studies is that there's B cell infiltrate in both of these patients, which is outlined in red by CD20. But in this patient up above, it's much less, and the organization of this structure looks to be a lot less defined than this one down at the bottom, where you see a clear B cell zone here, and you have, see CD4 T cells predominantly adjacent to it. This is a true um, kind of tertiary lymphoid structure um, and less of a lymphoid aggregate, and it's actually a bit more mature than this structure up here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And um, tertiary lymphoid structures sit in the stromal pockets, so while you can see tumor around here, that's where they reside. Um, and um, that's where most of the B cells then reside. So if we do counts and we compare um, B cells in the stroma here in blue versus those in the tumor, you can see a very large difference in that number, and there's more in the stroma. And there's other cell types in the two compartments, but it's definitely more pronounced, most pronounced that the B cells are highly in the um, stromal compartments versus the tumor. We've also validated this by flow cytometry, where we've looked at lung cancer specimens with tumor and tumor adjacent tissue, and we've looked at total numbers of um, all different immune cells, and we've done a ratio of the total numbers from tumor to tumor adjacent tissue. And what's quite striking is what you can see is that B cells in these patient tissues are sometimes increased 20 to 80 fold, um, whereas CD4 and CD8 T cells are increased, but not to the same degree. So it's not that the T cells aren't there and they're not important. It's just that there's a higher amount or influx of B cells um, at the tumor. Further, we've expanded um, into other tumor types, starting to look at not only B cells, but the amount of plasma cells that are present. Um, and one thing that's quite clear is that um, the, there's more B cells in head and neck and lung cancer than plasma cells. And when we get into some other indices, such as ovarian or ascites as a result of ovarian cancer or even metastatic lung effusions, we're starting to see that it's not necessarily as big of a difference between those two, two cell types. So while that's not the focus of today's talk, that in and of itself is interesting because these are obviously um, B cells have to be a B cell before it becomes a plasma cell. So there might be something happening with the trajectory and differentiation of the B cells in these different tumor microenvironments. So the way that I like to um, frame the questions is thinking about, you know, what is key to our understanding of B cells in TLS and human cancer. So within the um, News and Views article that was written, I came up with a schematic um, to kind of illustrate immature TLS versus mature TLS and what that might do to downstream function. Um, and in the papers in, um, in January um, in Nature, they actually indicated that having more of an immature TLS indicated lower T cell activity and having a more mature TLS where you see a very nice defined um, B cell center with CD4 T cells around it would correlate with higher T cell activity. And that might be due to the fact that um, functions such as antigen presentation and anti-tumor anti -tumor antibody production is increased. Um, and maybe when it's immature, there's more contact of the B cell with the tumor. And so therefore, there's more inhibition of the B cell or just the B cell becoming inhibitory itself. And so from that, um, these are some of the key questions we're trying to attack in the lab. One is thinking about the heterogeneity of B cells. Um, in TLS and cancer, and just really trying to understand what that heterogeneity is so we know how to better target them. Um, the second is thinking about how having a TLS might influence B cell function, which I've kind of explained here with this left schematic. And the third is um, thinking about 
how to induce TLS in cancer patients, which is something we'll um, come back to uh, later on in the talk. So to kind of get to the first point, thinking about function of B cells and, and the heterogeneous function of B cells, there was a paper published um, from my postdoc studies in cancer immunology research in 2017 that um, was done in lung cancer patients again. And what we did is we established an antigen presentation assay that we still use in the lab now. Um, and um, we looked at the ability of the B cell to educate CD4 T cells, especially given the fact that they are in such close proximity in these tertiary lymphoid structures. And so what you can see here is we purify the B cells and T cells and we put them back in the co-culture in even amounts. And then we look at T cell proliferation as a readout. And the way this works is you can either add no lysate in and just look at the endogenous response, or you can add in different lysates because B cells can pick up protein and process it very quickly. And it can present it on MHC class two and then educate the CD4 T cell. And so what we see here without any lysate in is that there's very clearly three patients here and every patient is a, a dot in a different shape. There's three patients here in purple that the T cells respond right away. Whereas the patients here in green and blue, there is no response. But what happens as we add in different lysates, we see that some of these patients in green start to respond. And the different conditions are EBV lysate, which is a control because most people are exposed to EBV and there'll be a T cell response as a result. Autologous tumor lysate, which is where we see the biggest response in these patients in green, um, and a full length um, cancer testes antigen that has been shown to um, have significant T cell responses in lung cancer patients, stage one. So we see some responses in all these green patients with all conditions. And then you can see the patients in blue, they just, they just don't respond. So this was very much key to thinking about the heterogeneity. And you can go on to read more about what we, we found in these lung cancer patients, but some key things that we've thought about since then is in this paper, we really divided B cells into activated and non-activated, and that's not really fair. There's a lot of heterogeneity, and I'll speak to that here um, in the next few minutes. Uh, but when we did that, and we just looked at activation versus non-activation, we saw that at the end of the co-culture, the CD4 T cell phenotype changed. So when the B cells were more activated, you got more of a Th1 interfering gamma producing CD4 T cell. But when the B cells were not activated, you got more of a Treg, non-interfering gamma producing FOXP3 positive cell. So that led us to start thinking about other T cell phenotypes. And the other T cell phenotype that I want to introduce here that's very important in the tumor microenvironment, particularly in these tertiary lymphoid structures, are T follicular helper cells. And so um, we wanted to think about whether or not B cells maintain TFH, or, and we know that they interacted with them in normal lymphoid tissues, but how does this happen in the tumor microenvironment? We also wanted to think about comparing B cells to other myeloid cells. So all other um, CD11C positive myeloid cells that could potentially present antigen, how do B cells compare in the tumor microenvironment? And to just show a snapshot of that in lung cancer patients, what you're looking at here is a readout of CXCR5, which is a marker for TFH, as well as interferon gamma, which is a marker for TH1, as I already indicated. And these are T cells that are extracted and cultured by themselves from the tumor of lung cancer patients. And you can see that there's CXCR5 TFH cells, but not a lot of interferon gamma production, which is not surprising. When we add in all other myeloid cells, um, not B cells, but CD11C positive APCs, we see CXCR5 maintained, but very little interferon gamma production. But when we spike the B cells in, um, and we do that co-culture with B cells and T cells alone, we see interferon gamma production increase and CXCR5 maintained. So this was really key to us thinking about further experiments down the road and really cross comparing um, myeloid cells and B cells in the tumor microenvironment, but also looking at the readout of the T cell, which I'll talk a little bit about the former um, toward the end of the talk again. And one last piece of data that was really striking is we went back and looked at some of the patients that actually responded um, in the fact that the T cells responded. Um, and these patients did um, clinically better as well. So all these patients in purple and green did better because they probably have a more optimal immune microenvironment. Um, it's probably not just the B cells, but um, they also had a better CD4 T cell response when they were co-cultured with the B cells. And what was clear is if you look at all of this brown staining, those are islands of B cells. That's CD20 staining, and those are tertiary lymphoid structures. So there's more TLS in these patients when there's better antigen presence. So that gives a snapshot and some views into looking at um, you know, function and linking, linking it to um, 
the B cell function to the B cell phenotype and then to the subsequent T cell response. And that's all well and good, but this is, um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And really what we wanted to do is we wanted to really get into the different types of B cells that could be in the tumor microenvironment and how these different tumor microenvironments could influence B cells. And so that's why at the time that I came to Pitt, I was still moving forward these lung cancer studies, um, but I also was starting to work on head and neck cancer. And so I'm going to switch over to that now because I think it's a good time to talk about why we use head and neck cancer and show some of those data before we, we talk about lung cancer again. And so head and neck cancer actually is a good tumor type to study B cells. And that's already been established in the literature for multiple reasons. First of all, it has two etiologies and there are some differences um, within these etiologies, like for example, you can have people that are HPV positive and have carcinogen, carcinogens that drive the disease. But for our purposes, we bin the patients into HPV positive and HPV negative, virally driven versus carcinogen, carcinogen, carcinogen driven. And that's the HPV negative. And so in the literature, what's been shown is if you look at the intertumoral immune infiltrate, you see um, T cells um, and macrophages in both HPV positive and negative but you can see a very large influx of B cells in HPV positive. Further, in a very large study where they looked at survival, they looked at HPV positive versus HPV negative patients. And HPV positive patients that had high infiltrate of immune cells had mostly B cells here. And that's in the, in the actual paper if you dig into the paper. And you can also see this trend with HPV negative, but to a lesser degree when there's a high infiltrate. So this was pretty convincing that B cells were, this was a good model to look at B cells and to look at them in virally induced cancer versus not. And so um, because of that increase in the tumors, we wanted to look at transcriptional and locational differences in those B cells. So the first thing we did is we embarked on a large single cell RNA-seq study that was actually um, published in Immunity in January from our group. Um, the leader of that paper is Tony Sillo, a very talented postdoc in the Vignali lab that I co-mentor. And so um, Dario Vignali and Bob Ferris are co-senior authors on this manuscript with me. It was a very large undertaking. Um, and we did um, single cell by 10X. I probably don't have to introduce this to the group, but 10X allows you to um, basically have barcoded uh, gel beads that you then flow through with immune cells or any cell of choice. In this case, we did CD45 positive cells that were isolated and that were viable. Um, and it's a drop seek method. So for every one bead, you see a cell and you can see this in real time in this video. And um, we then generate and collect all of the um, pooled um, single cells um, or all the barcoded single cells. And then we do library prep and sequencing. And then we can do this downstream application of looking at cell population identification um, and um, it, via a TISNI or a UMAP, whatever your choice is. And then we can link that to where those cells come from, the different tissue types and the different cell types that are abundant. So what was, um, what was pretty clear from the paper um, was, and you can read about this as well now, is that there was a very large data set. We had quite a few HPV negative and um, less HPV positive, but that's not surprising given the incidence. Um, and we also had five healthy donor tonsil from sleep apnea patients, so they did not have cancer, so they were baseline lymphoid tissues for a comparison, which is really important for B cells, and then six healthy donor PDMC. So we had quite a few cells we analyzed, and you can see here two islands of B cells that pop out that are quite distinct. And that's what I'll be focusing on for the rest of the talk. However, you can pull this paper offline and look at all the different cell types that are listed here, because Tony did a really excellent job um, on the workup of all the different cell types. And so um, basically what you can see here then is the different islands of cells. And what Tony did was he actually ranked them as to ones that were the most transcriptionally di distinct between HPV positive and HPV negative. And so what you see here is a bar graph showing cells that are less similar versus more similar when you go from left to right in HPV positive versus HPV negative. And the take home here is that B cells are one of the most transcriptionally distinct cells in the microenvironment when you look at HPV positive versus HPV negative. And I'll talk about this more here in a, in a minute. What's also interesting is that CD4 and CD8 T regs are obviously in both etiologies, but they're not as transcriptionally distinct as B cells, um, monocytes, um, or monocyte lineage rather, and um, T conventional CD4s. And what's interesting about that collectively is that these three populations here are actually what are in TLS structures most predominant. 
So what we did then after seeing this is we actually took the B cells out and um, segregated them bioinformatically and then looked at the different clusters that um, came out from that bioinformatic analysis. And so what you can see here are 11 distinct clusters when we just look at the B cells. And this TISNY is showing the, all the different clusters. The middle TISNY here is showing the different tissues that those um, clusters are coming from. And then this compiled bar graph is showing all 11 clusters and then the ratios basically of where they're coming from. So for example, dark green or HPV positive um, till and dark blue is HPV negative till. And so to make a long story short, because this is a very detailed slide, is that um, there were canonical clusters or canonical subtypes of B cells that we could identify. So clusters one through four were germinal center B cells, clusters five was plasma cells, six and nine were naive, and cluster seven were switched memory B cells. And not only can we see these different clusters, you can see a, um, an enhancement in HPV positive versus HPV negative for one type of B cell versus another. In particular, in HPV positive, they were very enriched for clusters one through four, as you can see here. And for HPV negative, they were enriched for clusters five and seven, which are plasma cells and switch memory cells. Mm -hmm. So this shows pretty definitively that there's very distinct differences in the B cell heterogeneity when you're in two different um, um, microenvironments, one viral and one not viral. Um, and so what we wanted to do, since we, we had a lot of cells for our single cell, but we wanted to really add more breadth to this and give some survival analysis to it and have more patients involved, we then went back to the TCGA and we looked at survival um, of the patients in the TCGA. So to set that context, I just want to show you where the... Um, where the, the different cells lie within this trajectory. So the naive B cell has to come in to um, the germinal center, and there's two zones, dark zone and light zone, but I won't be talking about that today um, for the sake of time. But basically, we did analyze this further. And in the germinal center, they toggle back between dark zone and light zone, and this is where they interact with TFH cells or T follicular helper cells. And then eventually, they should get kicked out and become a memory B cell or a plasma cell. So this is a very general, um, schematic of the B cell heterogeneity and, and where it all comes into play for the trajectory, which we'll come back to um, a little bit later as well. And so when we looked at this survival, we saw that B cells in general trended with better survival. Germinal center B cells also um, indicated better survival um, when you had more of them. Memory as well. And plasma cells trended with worse survival. Um, and I won't be talking about any of these other, these other two populations today, although we're following up on both of them. I'm going to focus in on the germinal center piece because germinal center B cells have been very well described in lymphoid tissues. Um, they are known to be paramount for a very optimal, maximal moral response in, um, in those um, lymphoid tissues and in individuals in general. So we really wanted to understand how germinal center B cells might be the same or different in um, these two different etiologies. Um, the last thing to mention on this slide is TFH signatures were also correlated with increased survival um, in, in these patients, and that goes well with the germinal center, um, germinal center survival graph, given this schematic here on the left. So the next thing we wanted to do was we wanted to validate our transcriptomics with protein. And, and this is pretty important because you, you have a lot of data you get from single cell, but you always want to validate by protein because there may be things that might not be as clear um, in the transcriptomics, or you might not see as big of differences, or there might be dropouts. So we wanted to validate um, the two subtypes, germinal center B cells in particular, um, and look at that quantification. So we did this by um, high dimensional flow cytometry. So these TISNY plots here are actually from flow cytometry data from HPV positive and negative till that were run at the same time. And what you can see is we can isolate out the same types of um, um, cells that you saw in the, in the TISNYs from single cell before. And what's really important to note here is that you have germinal center B cells that pop out very highly in HPV positive and less so in HPV negative, which is what we saw. Um, and we also see um, naive B cells increase in HPV positive, which was also the case um, in the previous slide um, compared to HPV negative. Um, and what we're also, we also see are some additional populations pop out that we didn't necessarily see in the single cell, in particular activated pre-germinal center B cells, which are important for um, the progression to this germinal center piece. And what we did then was we quantified by traditional flow cytometry dating and saw that in HPV positive, we had more germinal center B cells than in HPV negative. 
Um, we also looked at plasma cells because they don't fall out of this TISNI because they're not in the, the CD19 positive, 20 positive double gate. They're going to be outside of that because um, they're usually CD20 dim. And what we saw there was that um, there was a trend toward more NMP negative, similar to what we saw in transcriptomics, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So while this is great, we also wanted to look at location. It's pretty important, as I mentioned earlier, because B cells reside in these tertiary lymphoid structures. So we did this first by just single plex IHC, looking at CD20 and comparing to a positive control, which is a healthy donor tonsil. And so what you can see here is that um, there's a lot of CD20 staining. Everything is lighting up brown. And you can see even some of these germinal center structures, even from a, far, from a very um, zoomed out view here. And if you were to ask a pathologist to score a normal tonsil for TLS, they would say there's over 500 in a, in a tonsil pathologically. So we wanted to then look in um, HPU positive and HPU negative tissue sections. And so we looked first in tonsils that had tumors because you get them more in HPV positive in the oral pharynx, but they can occur in HPV negative. What's very striking here is you can see a large reduction in the brown staining for CD20 in both sections, but more so in HPV negative. So these are both tonsils, and this tonsil is basically devoid of B cell infiltrate. There is some TLS here you can see, but it's very low. And there's more in HPV positive, but not as much as the positive control. So when there's tumor, there is, um, um, there's going to be some re-altering and some alterations, rather, to this microenvironment, but we still have this maintenance of B cells in HPV positive compared to HPV negative. And we also see that in non-immune non tissue, such as the tongue, and this is illustrated here in two sections in tongue with the same sort of staining. So we uh, um, had our pathologist, Angel Liu, actually quantify this and count TLS structures by CD20 staining because pathologically they're able to do that. It's not the, the best marker, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but we can use it for an initial count. And so what we saw is that in the tumor, um, we saw increase of TLS and HPV positive compared to HPV negative. However, in the non-tumor tissue, they were even in the two indices. So this again goes back to the point of B cells flexing to the tumor and there being more structures closer to the tumor in that peritumoral space and even in the tumor and, and, and trying to understand that importance. Further, B cells are often within TLS despite their TLS, despite their HPV status. So similar to lung cancer, like I showed you earlier, the B cells are mostly in TLS structures. There are some that get into the tumor bed, but they tend to gravitate toward these structures. So then what we did is we started to look by multiplex um, immunofluorescence. So this is again Vectra, and this was done by a very talented um, graduate student in the lab, Siley Anker, who actually um, does a lot of the training for our Vectra staining and, and, and has become a real whiz with this technology. And um, what we did was we, care, we compared a healthy donor tonsil, which you can see very nicely, a nice B cell center with punctated macrophage infiltration and CD4 T cell around, around it. This is a really nice germinal center um, in a healthy donor tonsil. And so when we look at an HPV positive tumors, such as the base of tongue, we can see something similar, maybe not as large as this one, but we still see those same sort of infrastructure. However, you can see that the heterogeneity varies because we can see in another HPV positive tumor in the tongue, it looks as though these are starting to become more organized, but it's not very distinct like these two here. And then lastly, in HPV negative, we can get like a nice germinal center. Um, like we can in other um, HPV positive tumors or healthy donor tonsil. But again, this even looks slightly different than these two um, by size, and even the cell infiltrate is not as robust here as it is here. So this is just to point out that this heterogeneity um, is something that we're continuously working on. So it's not a straightforward answer. It's a really big, large research effort in the lab to really look at heterogeneity in multiple tumor types and try to define this better in a more objective way um, because we know it can be similar to healthy donor like lymphoid tissue, but it, it isn't always. And so we're really trying to understand this better. But for the purposes of this study, we really just wanted to rate germinal center-like versus non-germinal center-like TLS. So something that's a germinal center-like TLS is gonna be this, because it looks very like, much like this, but there's probably some things about it that aren't exactly the same. And so we don't wanna call it just a germinal center. That's why we say germinal center-like. Um, and so what we did is we had the pathologist go back and count then not just TLS, but germinal center-like versus non-germinal center-like TLS, just for simplicity purposes to start. And so this is showing a snapshot of that even by CD20 staining. So if you ask a pathologist, 
from a CD20 staining to identify a germinal center versus a non-germinal center like TLS. They can do that by looking at um, the CD20 staining and the formation of this germinal center, as you can see very clearly here. And not only did we look at that distinction, but we looked intratumorally, peritumorally, where these are mostly found, these TLS structures, and in the non-tumor area, because we had whole slide sections that we could do that with. And so that's what this graph is showing here. So germinal center like TLS are higher in HPV positive here in blue, both intratumorally and peritumorally compared to HPV negative. But again, the non-tumor are similar. And this is really striking because um, we are able to classify the germinal center like TLS, but also because we're starting to see um, these germinal center like TLS in the actual tumor, which is not something that has been shown in other, um, 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 other studies to date. So, um, so this is important and, and something that we need to be thinking about when they're on the peritumoral space versus within the tumor. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to correlate this back to survival. So the cohort that we picked um, had a great, num a, a really great follow-up, and this is follow-up in days actually. Um, and we looked at germinal center-like versus non-germinal center-like. And what we saw is that if you're HPV positive and you have more germinal center-like TLS, you um, you actually do better than if you don't have. And, but it's also the case in HPV negative. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, that's just because HPV positive patients do better. Yes, they do. But the HPV negative patients also have a similar trend when they have germinal center like TLS. They just have less. Um, and then lastly, bringing it back to kind of the other cell types in there, we also wanted to kind of start to think about, you know, um, TFH cells and the other cells that are involved in this process. So we had the pathologist also count CXCR5 expression in histological sections in HPV positive versus HPV negative. And it was very clear that in HPV positive, there's much more CXCR5 expression than in HPV negative. So this, again, um, basically validates some of our transcriptomic studies and our follow-up flow cytometry showing that, you know, we have more B cells, we have now more germinal center-like B cells, and now the TFH are also following suit, which is what we would expect. So the question from here really says, well, why are TLS so heterogeneous? I keep coming back to this because it's a question that we're still trying to tackle and will be for a while, I think. So it's possible that the markers for TLS are incomplete. Maybe there's some markers that are underappreciated, and that's what I'll talk about next. Um, we've also thought about distinct cell-cell neighborhoods that might influence this, or unique TMEs that might influence this. So I've already shown you the difference of HPV positive and negative, but I'll also show you some differences in lung cancer patients, which is also even more different in comparison um, to head and neck cancer. So to come at this first question of incomplete TLS markers, one thing that we went back and looked at um, via um, the SciTech, which again, um, this was um, captained by um, Ayana Ruffin in the lab. Um, she is a, a graduate student focused on B cells and TLS. And what we can look at now is the same sort of TISNI plots from the flow cytometry data, but it basically gives you feature plots showing high and low expression of different markers for B cells. And so the one that popped out was this cluster here. This is the germinal center cluster, and it's marked by CD38 expression. Um, and the, the semaphore A is very, very bright. And so semaphore A has been shown to mark human germinal center B cells, and that's been shown in non-tumor tissue. And what we really wanted to understand is how this might be different in tumor tissue. So what we did was we then quantified um, this expression in um, the tumor tissue. And so what we saw, both by MFI and percent, that in head and neck cancer till, germinal center B cells and pre-germinal center B cells that I described earlier have higher expression of semaphore A by both MFI and percent than other um, populations within that same tumor microenvironment, but also compared to healthy donor tonsil. So as I mentioned, it's already been described that semaphore A marks these B cells um, that are germinal center B cells, but maybe it's a better marker in the tumor tissue, and it seems that it's enhanced in the tumor tissue. So we think that this marker could have a lot to do with the formation of TL TLS and getting to a more germinal center like TLS in the end. The other way we looked at this was by um, IHC, single plex IHC. And what we saw was we, we compared BCL6, which is a hallmark germinal center marker. And what you can see here is BCL6 is quite nicely staining this healthy donor tonsil, and this is a germinal center. But as you look at some of these um, HPV positive and negative tumors, these germinal center-like areas, which are canonically and pathologically TLS, if you ask the pathologist, they'll say, yeah, that's a TLS. They're not staining as nicely for BCL6 as the healthy donor tonsil. And even in some HPV positive tumors, when you have like a pre-germinal center like TLS, and what's happening here is there's a CD20 aggregate here that then we looked at BCL6 on, BCL6 staining is almost non-existent. 
However, when you look at semaphore A, what's really interesting is you see it both on the healthy donor tonsil, you see it to an increased degree in the HPV positive tumor, and then in the HPV negative tumor, you see it, but mostly on the macrophages, which are these larger cells here, pathologically, and then you also see it in the predermal sac. So this is really interesting that it's increased, and it almost seems like it's staining a bit better than BCL6. So we're formally following up on this and trying to understand it better, um, but what I can tell you is that semaphore A in our single cell analysis also marks GC, B cells really, really distinctly, and um, when we do pseudo time analysis, it marks the progression of a naive B cell to a, through a pre-germinal state to a germinal center. So it very much supports some of these protein analyses that we're looking at. Um, I mentioned cell-cell neighborhoods. So one other thing that we did with these germinal center-like and non-germinal center-like TLS is we looked at the cell-cell neighborhoods that come out of having a germinal center versus a non-germinal center-like TLS. And what's striking is that the germinal center-like TLS, the interactions are what you would expect. There's a lot of tumor-tumor interactions because these are this is very tightly um, compacted together, but, um, and then a lot of B cell interactions, a lot of interactions with T conventional cells. But when this goes away, the primary interaction in non-GC like TLS are Tregs and CD8s. And so this, this suggests the more pro-tumor environment occurring. Um, we also looked, as I mentioned, at um, the viral proteins or thinking about the viral proteins and the different tumor microenvironments. So one thing that we're following up on now and, and we have some preliminary data on is that the virus seems to um, have a different effect on the types of B cell infiltrate that's there. And the reason we've come to that conclusion is we were first looking at this um, graph that I showed you earlier, um, but it's simplified, just showing HPV positive and negative for total TLS numbers um, in the tumor. And you can see that it is increasing HPV positive, but there's a large spread here of the TLS numbers. So we got to thinking, well, maybe there's differences up here versus down here, and maybe some of these patients look more like these patients, um, which are HPV negative. So we collaborated with um, Jim Pippis, who looks at um, viral oncogenesis, and he um, and his lab mined the TCGA and looked at um, viral protein distribution for um, E67 alone or additional viral proteins. So you can see here about 26% of the patients are E67 alone, whereas 47% of the patients also have other viral proteins, predominantly E4 and E5 were the two that they found. And when they looked at the gene sets that came out when you had these two additional viral proteins, it was a very strong leukocyte signature and actually very strong for um, germinal centers. So CD19, CD27, CD4, CXCR5, CXCR4, all ones that I've mentioned or are new that actually mark B cells or T cells and therefore germinal center markers. And if you're looking at one of these graphs, these are patients that have E4, E5 in addition to E67. These are patients that have E67 alone. And these are patients that are HPV negative. So when you compare these two, they look more similar than the patients that have additional viral proteins. So now we have a follow-up going on between Ayana Ruffin and another student in the lab, Xian Li, um, trying to understand the impact of these viral proteins on um, B cell and TLS function. The other thing I should note before moving on to the last piece is that we cross-compared this with our single cell data I showed you earlier, and a lot of these genes that popped out as overlapping are ones that we would predict in um, TLS and our important anti-tumor B cell function and T cell function, so that was very encouraging. So to um, finish off the talk, I just want to talk a little bit about our um, lung cancer efforts um, now. I talked a little bit about it at the beginning, but that was branching from my postdoc into my, um, my faculty position. Um, I want to come back to this, this slide where we're thinking about the key questions. And I've talked some about the heterogeneity and really emphasize that, and we've talked some about the function, and I'll do that again a little bit at the end. But I think one thing that we need to think about if we're trying to induce TLS, and actually maybe one thing is several things, is we have to look at other solid tumors. So that's why we look at different indices. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about lung here at the end. We need to think more about spatial bioinformatics because while the single cell of um, single cell RNA seq of single cell suspensions gives us information, we don't get the spatial information. So we're we're captaining and looking at some of that. Um, we want to think about lung cancer progression. So what happens as a patient progresses to lung cancer, and also matching markers with function. So not only understanding the heterogeneity of the B cells and the heterogeneity of the function um, when there's a TLS versus a not, but how do we match key markers with function? And then lastly, interrogating non-immune cells. So I just want to touch on a couple of these. I won't touch on all of them. They're all things we're thinking of, but I just want to touch on a few. 
So one, the first thing I want to show is just how different the spatial distribution of B cells and TLS are in lung cancer or non-small cell lung cancer tumors. And this is um, work happened by um, a student in the lab, Mia Liu, who's working on lung cancer-related studies. This is the same basic immunophenotyping panel I showed you earlier, but it's showing very vast differences in the TLS structures across the board. So we actually have patients that have no TLS structures. And in lung cancer, the incidence is lower than in head and neck cancer, so that's not surprising. We have type two, which we're calling now, that are distant to the tumor and are more um, um, associated with the bronchus. And then we have type three and four that are peritumoral and that look more like non-GC-like and GC-like. And that's just based off of the infiltrate that's there and seeing this nice kind of formation of this dense CD20 ring starting, although it is not as advanced or mature as what you see in head, what you saw in head and neck cancer. So again, there might be um, a pre pre germinal center and then a pre germinal center and then a germinal center. So we're we're trying to we're trying to work this out. So one thing that will help with this is thinking about bioinformatically and spatially how we can put these things together and identify TLS heterogeneity. And um, one way we're doing that, it, we're doing it several ways, but one way I wanted to share with you is by using the nanostring DSP, um, which we actually have available at Pitt. And um, it's actually in my core that I run. So um, we, we can segregate the slide by tumor, normal adjacent, and distant adjacent. And this is a lung cancer tissue. And um, this is um, pan-CK staining is in green. And then you can see um, CD45 is all the pink. And so you can carve out regions of interest that are tertiary lymphoid structures in these different areas and then cross compare similarities or differences of those structures. And so I want to give kudos to the bioinformatics team that's capturing this, Sunny and Raj. Um, and then um, the wet lab is Mike and Shelley within um, the core. And so, um, so what happens after we look at this is we get heat maps that can come together. And this is a really detailed slide, but the point of this is not for you to understand every single gene on here. Um, but to look at the comparisons of tumor, tumor border, distal adjacent, or normal adjacent. And you can see here um, vast differences in the um, heat map. And what's really clear is that the tumor border, you have this group of genes that look to be a little bit more homogeneous at the tumor border for TLSs, and each one of these is a region of interest. And so you can see like kind of a group of clustering genes, whereas in the tumor, they're very, very different from each other. And in the normal adjacent, you're seeing clustering. So it's as if you move further away from the tumor into the distant that you're seeing less, you're seeing more heterogeneity as you get closer to the tumor and less as you move further away. Of course, we need to interrogate this further and look at the different markers that are here and what that might mean. And we need to do more patient tissues, but this is just one example of what we're doing to kind of understand this spatially um, for both protein analysis and mRNA analysis. The other thing we're doing, which is a very large endeavor, is we're looking at lung cancer progression. We've assembled very fantastic cohorts of normal smoker lungs, normal non-smoker lungs, COPD lungs, lung cancer, overt lung cancer, bone mets, and pleural effusions. And this is by active collaboration with all of these individuals listed here. And we can look in pre-malignancy, primary cancer, and metastasis and understand the progression. And so what I'm going to show you today is just in this early stage in tissue sections, what we're seeing differences in normal lungs into COPD patients. And so what you can see here is that the non-smoker, um, and this is a more um, sophisticated panel to really look at B-cell and TLS structures because we have CXCR5, smooth muscle actin, IgD for naive B-cells, and PNAD for high endothelial venules in addition to CD20 and CD4. So you can see non-smokers really have random infiltrate and not really a lot of TLS. What's interesting in smokers is that you can see that there are structures forming, but they're mainly B-cells and they're IgD negative. So they're mainly memory is, is what we're, we're concluding here for now. And then in COPD, you start to see this appearance of HEVs or high endothelial venules in P with PNAD staining, as you can see here when in the zoomed in view. And you can see more naive B cells being recruited, which makes sense because as I mentioned earlier, naive B cells have to get in in order to, um, in order to be in a, in, a, in a structure and then get educated in a germinal center and then proceed on to memory or memory or naive, or excuse me, memory or plasma cell. So this is really encouraging. And so what we're doing now is we're um, actually building up the numbers and quantifying um, this in several patients to understand what it looks like across the board. Um, the last thing that we're doing to kind of link 
to the last point, which is function with the actual types of B cells or key markers on B cells, is we're using malignant pleural effusions. And it's not perfect because it's not a solid tumor, but what the malign malignant pleural effusion allows is a lot of cells that come out of that effusion, and a, high, and a lot of them are highly infiltrated by C B cells as a result. And we can get sequential draws, and we have some nice controls, both benign by histolog histology or by heart failure patients that have, um, you know, these um, effusions that are drawn, but it's not due to cancer. And so what you can see here is that you see an increase in the B cell frequency, um, and the red line indicates what it is in normal healthy donor blood, 10%. And you can see an increase as we go across the board here. And so this allows us to look at B cell rich and B cell poor, but also to get enough B cells out to conduct the same functional, to conduct two functional assays on the same pool of B cells, which I think is really powerful and something we can't do as readily in solid tumors because of cell numbers. Despite our ability to use really low cell numbers, we still um, have to get a sense of what we're looking for before we do those assays. So this allows us to kind of understand that better. So what Mia did um, for this project is she actually did the same antigen presentation assay that I showed you earlier. But um, in this case, she not only did B cells, but she also looked at the same myeloid cells, our CD11C positive myeloid cells from the same patient. And so what you can see here is there's a color coding at the bottom where there's B cells that didn't present antigen in red. It didn't matter if you co-cultured them, gave them co-stimulation, gave them an external um, EBV lysate, um, it, it didn't happen. But what happened with the blue and yellow is that you have um, the baseline here with just the T and B cells together. When you give co-stimulation, it goes up. And then for some patients, it goes up even more with EBV lysate. And then we showed that this was specific by blocking with a pan-MHC class 2 antibody. And then the antigen presentation goes down, for the most part, just one patient where it looks like it's more nonspecific. Um, or there's some specificity, but there's some nonspecific kind of response. Um, and and what also what we also did here back to the point from earlier is we directly compared um, you know the differences between the B cells and the myeloid cells. So it's not the myeloid um, antigen presentation is not shown here for simplicity's sake. But if we look at the ratio um, and look at the total proliferation for B cells versus B cell education versus myeloid cell education. We see that here in blue, these are the patients where they had better CD4 T cell proliferation as a readout with the B cells. And this is where um, the myeloid cells did better or the B cells were equivalent. So we're seeing these differences in the function compared to other myeloid cells. Further, what, what this study allowed is we can now start to link some of the key markers we would think be involved with antigen presentation with proliferation of the CD4 T cell or the readout of the assay. So semaphore A is in there based off what I told you earlier, CD69 for tissue residents, CD83 for um, light zone um, germinal center B cells, CD40 and HLADR in general because they're required for antigen, proper antigen presentation. And you can see as those increase here, then the um, proliferation also increases. And, and that's pretty encouraging. And then lastly, we actually were, were able to pair the assays um, for antigen presentation and antibody secretion. And I haven't really talked about antibody secretion at all during this talk, but it is something we're actively pursuing and we're trying to look at the amount of antibody and the specificity of the antibodies. Um, but what we did in this assay is we linked proliferation with antibody secretion. And so what you can see clearly here is that patients that had um, some patients here that did really well with um, antigen presentation and had a really nice, there was a nice CD4 T cell response as a result, made very little antibody. And then that inverses for other patients. Some patients are still non-functional for both, and some patients are what, what we're calling multifunctional. So what we can do with TISNI um, versus the spectral cytometry is we can then start to put these into pots of cells that then we can look at the different markers that are um, governing these different um, populations and understand how we can link some of these markers up here with antibody function versus antigen presentation, for example. Now, this is a little bit limited because we're only looking at two functions, and I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of functions, but we will continue to expand upon this. So with that, I'm going to end, and um, all the summary here 
is things that I've said throughout the talk. So I'm not going to spend time on it because I'm very close to my time limit. I do want to emphasize that there's still a lot that's unknown. I think we've made a lot of um, progress understanding the B cells and um, solid tumors, but there's a lot of things to do. And probably more appropriate, um, these are some of our future directions that I've kind of mentioned as I've gone along. Um, but um, we're really trying to think about the complete TME. We are developing physiologically relevant mouse models so we can back translate um, some of our studies into a, into a model that makes sense. Um, and we're really um, looking at a lot of antibody studies as well. I just, um, they were not ready to share today. Um, lastly, I want to thank the team. I want to thank my lab, and I highlighted people as I went. Um, they're all listed here. I want to highlight um, Dario Vignali and his fantastic group. We work very closely on a lot of T cell related projects, but he's been very supportive of the B cell projects and has, um, uh, and um, people in his group have really helped out tremendously. Um, the lung cancer program, um, the head and neck cancer program, um, all of the other collaborators at um, the Hillman Cancer Center, um, my funding, and obviously patients and families for donating. Um, this is the group. This is admittedly an old picture and needs updated, so we will do that soon um, because this is a, a, a compilation of both Vignali and Bruno Labs. Um, but one thing I want to highlight is I, I really love the team I work with, and I think they're very talented, and we um, do a lot of great science, I think, but we also celebrate together. So this is all of us at my wedding last year. I'm actually coming up on my one-year anniversary, um, and we had a great time. So um, normally I would take questions, but because this is recorded, I will um, stop here. And if um, anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much for this opportunity.